Welcome to our final lecture uh, of our winter quarter lecture series for the program on race, inequality, language, and education here at Stanford Graduate School of Education. I am Shima Salehi, and on behalf of my colleagues, I would like to welcome you to our session today on Indigenous education. Before anything to start us today, let me introduce our moderator. Today's moderator is going to be one of our incredible graduate students, Dania Fagan. Dania has been born and raised in her ancestry lands of Columbia, River, Plateau, and Basin in what is currently known as Oregon. She has been raised in Omitilla Indian Reservation, where she had the opportunity to grow up immersed in her tribe traditional, cultural, linguistic, and religious practices. Dania is currently enrolled at Stanford uh, Education uh, Training Program, uh, and she will be graduating this June with her master's degree and also certification in, in teaching secondary English languages and art. Dania is eager to continue uh, her work as a teacher to foster care and safety for her indigenous students through language revitalization, culturally sustaining pedagogy, and indigenized curricula. Danya, take it away. Thank you, Katyayo. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm calling today from Stanford's campus, uh, which sits on the stolen ancestral homelands of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. Um, in order to build honorable relationships with indigenous communities, um, it's important that we acknowledge um, and make visible the indigenous peoples whose land we are on. Um, and so to move from lip service towards action, I want to drop two links in the chat. Oh my gosh, I was muted. I'm so sorry. That's like classic early 2020 mistake. I was muted the whole time. I apologize. Um, Katsiayo, and thank you. Um, and um, yes, I wanted to do a land acknowledgement. So I'm calling today from Stanford's campus, um, which sits on the um, stolen ancestral homelands of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. Um, in order to build honorable relationships with indigenous communities, it's important that we acknowledge and make visible um, the indigenous peoples whose lands we are occupying. Um, so to move from lip service towards action, I dropped uh, just dropped a link in the chat towards um, a series of Zoom presentations co-created by Stanford students and members of the Ohlone tribe designed to create visibility and connection between the university and the indigenous community that we're occupying. Um, I'm also dropping a link to another um, web page on the Ohlone people's website um, that is a community letter um, demanding the return of stolen land. Um, so uh, yes, thank you, Claire. So um, yes, so I dropped these in the link to make sure that we're verbally acknowledging the land that we're on, but we're also um, moving towards action with that um, acknowledgement. Um, and with that, I will introduce our panel. Um, so the first person on our panel is Dr. Tiffany Lee. Um, Dr. Tiffany Lee is Black Sheep and was born for the Ogala Lakota Nation. She's from Crystal, New Mexico, um, located on the Navajo Nation on her mother's side um, and on Pine Ridge, South Dakota on her father's side. Dr. Lee is a professor and chair of Native American Studies at the University of New Mexico. Um, she earned her doctorate in sociology of education from Stanford University and her research examines native youth perspectives um, with regard to um, language reclamation and identity. She also investigates socioculturally centered educational approaches um, and is finally part of a US-wide study of indigenous language immersion schooling funded by the Spencer Foundation um, with two of our other visiting scholars, Dr. McCarty and Dr. Nicholas. Um, so Dr. Terry McCarty is um, a social cultural anthropologist who lives and works um, at, in Tovangar, the homelands of the um, and I'm so sorry, I should have checked the pronunciation before I did this. So Dr. McCarty, you can correct me. 
The Gabrielino Tongva. The, the Gabrielino Tongva, thank you. Um, Dr. McCarty is um, currently at UCLA where she was appointed um, as the George F. Neller Chair in Education and Anthropology um, and is a faculty um, of American Indian Studies. Her research uh, centers on indigenous education and critical social cultural studies of language planning and policy, uh, indigenous and minoritized language reclamation and the ethnography of education in and out of schools. Um, Dr. Sheila Nicholas is our um, next moderator or our next panelist. Um, she's a member of the Hopi tribe located in Arizona um, and is a professor in the Department of Teaching, Learning and Social Cultural Studies at the University of Arizona. She teaches courses in indigenous culture based education, um, language and culture, oral traditions, language minority education and teacher research. Um, she's also a faculty instructor for the American Indian Language Development Institute and an immersion instructor consultant for the Indigenous Language Institute um, in Santa Fe. Um, her scholarship and research focus includes Indigenous Hopi language maintenance and reclamation, Indigenous language ideologies and epistemologies, the intersection of language, culture and identity, and Indigenous language teacher education. Um, and our last panelist, um, certainly not least, Dr. Stephanie Moderman is an associate professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, she's interested in how university staff can support college students, um, indigenous methodologies, critical race theories, and indigenous geographies. Um, her research has been focused on the experiences of Native American or indigenous college students, and has re she's recently turned her attention to institutions where she thinks critically about questions such as how do First Nations or Native American student affairs units work um, and how do they support indigenous students and intersect with non-indigenous based units on campus? Um, so those are all of our awesome panelists today and we really appreciate you taking the time to um, come in and chat with us today. Um, and I'm gonna just go ahead and start with some questions and then we'll have some time for people to send me questions that they have and I will have space for that at the end. Um, so we're gonna start by thinking about language um, and about epistemologies. So Dr. Nicholas, your work is on um, native epistemology. Can you just tell us a little bit about native epistemology and as we're thinking about it in education, what do teachers specifically need to know? Uh, Sheila, I think you're muted. Okay, thank you for letting me know quickly. Uh, I'm just going to start right off and um, um, say that I'm borrowing from Lumbee scholar Brian Brayboy and colleagues who use Native and Indigenous epistemologies to mean how people come to know the things they know. So I look specifically at Genesis stories as at epistemologies, origin, creation, or emergence narratives, concretely and ideologically link language, people, identity, place, and life-sustaining subsistence practices as ways of knowing and coming to know epistemologies, and also encompass ways of being ontologies and ways of doing according to particular value systems, axiologies. So Genesis narratives allow us to appreciate the differences indigenous people have in terms of their own epistemologies, ontologies, axiologies, and methodologies. I want to um, share uh, uh, just a, a couple of slides here. I can do that really, I think. I hope it's, I hope it's this one. Is that correct? Are you seeing it okay? Okay. Uh, I highlight the Hopi Genesis story as an example. It is an em emergence narrative. In Hopi belief, all the people in the world, humankind, pass through three previous worlds, each time seeking a new life free of corruption and an escape from a life out of balance. At emergence, the people, not yet culturally and linguistically distinct from each other, encountered Maso, guardian of this fourth world, who offered everyone a choice of life way and the tools to pursue that life way. Groups of people embarked on a series of migrations in the four directions in search of the lands that would sustain their life way choices and foster their distinct identities. The small, short blue ear of corn was chosen by those who would become Hopi 
their tool was the planting stick. The search for the place that was sustained this humble but hardy corn ultimately led all these groups back to their place of emergence and preordained life plan, a communal farming life way, and through which they also entered into a spiritual covenant with Masao to steward Hopi lands. We live there today in what is now known as the Black Mesa region of Northeastern Arizona. And importantly, we continue to practice the communal farming life way, adapting to change, and the spiritual covenant remains indelible in the minds of contemporary Hopi. Want to change? Okay. In this slide, I highlight um, um, some frameworks, uh, particularly on the traditional Hopi way of life, or not wani, which is planting the short blue ear of corn by hand. It is intimately tied to this region of high and plateau lands, arid plateau lands. It is a practice that has its epistemological origins in this place and from which stems a distinct Hopi identity. It is a living life way. This landscape described as barren and desolate has produced a people who have devised a reciprocal ethical and spiritual relationship with this environment that as Deloria describes is from a sense of being personally involved in the functioning of this natural world. This understanding and accumulated knowledge has been transported across time and space through Hopi oral tradition, which I refer to as language as cultural practice, and that describe the linguistic and socioculturally structured environment that is lived and experienced implicitly, but can be articulated explicitly, and the interface of culture, language, and identity made more lucid. The Hopi life way is not simply one characterized by raising corn through dry farming practices. Inherently, the process and practices of raising corn are met metaphors about raising Hopi people who are caring, sharing, and self-sufficient, about living communally in small nurturing communities, and the essence of Hopi life as the communal way in which everyone participates in raising lives, both the plants and people, so that life will be rejuvenated. As we think about native and indigenous epistemology in schools and education, we can celebrate the compelling evidence of the resiliency of indigenous epistemological origins and work to apply them in restoring community well being and self determination. It offers the potential and possibilities of thinking in a different way regarding the role of indigenous languages and knowledge systems in the academic, familial, community, and cultural identities of indigenous students and learners, and the ways in which educators can understand and mediate those processes in order to cultivate and nurture resilient identities and provide an understanding that indigenous ways of knowing and being offer perspectives and insights that benefit all. Ms. Kweli. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. That was, that was wonderful. Um, I'm um, going to move to our next panelist who's going to talk to us um, about um, how policy impacts Indigenous language practices. So Dr. Terry McCarty, um, why is it so vital for Indigenous communities to sustain language and how does policy play in that? Okay. Thank you, Donia, for those questions. And, and also I thank everyone for the invitation to join this panel. I would also like to pay respect to the Ohlone people on whose lands and waters were gathered. Many of us are, are gathered today, and I, I do happen to be here at Stanford this year. So I'll start with the question, how does policy impact indigenous language practices? And I think the best way to answer that question is to ask another, why do we have a field of research and practice called language reclamation anyway? <laughs> to a large extent, we can point to policy in capital letters, explicit settler policies aimed at indigenous land, language and culture dispossession, and implicit and explicit policies of white supremacy and racial linguistic hierarchy. So 
Education policies that regulate the content and medium of instruction are among the most powerful anvils of what my colleague, K. Chanina Lamawana, uh, who also is a Stanford alumna, um, uh, Chanina and I have called erase and, and replace policies. And they've had multi-generational effects. Language loss is one of the most searing legacies of erase and replace. But policy is not only top down and nor is it totalizing. Policy is also bottom up, unofficial and grassroots. And these are the policy processes that I think we are uh, interested in. The grassroots work that drives the growing language and culture reclamation movement. So we use the term reclamation drawing on Miamia linguist Wesley Leonard's definition of reclamation as a larger effort by a community to claim its right to speak a language and to set associated goals in response to community needs and desired futures. Reclamation highlights the D or anti-colonial aims of indigenous language movements and their confluence with a larger global language movement. This movement has produced incredibly inspiring and innovative indigenous language education programs, some of which uh, Sheila, Tiffany and I and our UCLA colleague, Michael Seltzer are documenting in a US-wide study of indigenous language immersion schooling funded by the Spencer Foundation. And the programs are yielding remarkable multi-generational effects. I talked about the multi-generational effects of past policies. But listen to these <laughs> academic gains, language revitalization, and the self empowerment of students, their families, communities, and indigenous nations. What we have come to recognize as holistic well being. And the movement has also led to official policies that turn back centuries of state sponsored linguicide, the 1990 92 Native American Languages Act, the 2007 Esther Martinez Native American Languages Preservation Act and provisions in um, recent reauthorizations of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the most massive education policy in the United States for indigenous language revitalization programs. So why is it vital for indigenous communities to sustain their languages? Well, I hope I have at least partly answered that question with what I just discussed, but I think the best answer comes from the, the teachers, the parents, the elders, and the young people we've been privileged to meet um, and to interview in our study of indigenous language immersion. So I'd like to conclude this part of my remarks by sharing the words of a, of a then 17-year-old Native Hawaiian language learner that we interviewed um, in 2018, whose pseudonym is Akone. And toward the end of his interview, as we do with, with all of our interviews, we asked um, Akoni if there was anything he wanted to say to other young people about the role of the native language in his community and his own life. And I'll just share it in my words, but his words are, are obviously so much more powerful. I'll try to retain his emphases. He said, language is the key to the future and being able to bring back knowledge from the past to apply to current problems. Our Hawaiian people, they're entrepreneurs, they're voyagers of the vast sea, they're innovators, they're great agriculture workers, linguists, prophets, seers, observers. All the problems we have today, he said, can be, can be solved by reviving the practices our ancestors did. And the only way to revive it is through the language of the ancestors. Why is it vital? Well, across the diverse cultural, linguistic, and geographic settings in our study, the themes of relationality, identity, sense of place, belonging, family, and holistic well being, the kinds of things that Sheila just talked about, are knitted together through the indigenous language. And as Akone's words suggest, revitalizing and sustaining an ancestral language knits together the past, the present, and the future. It's a collective path toward wholeness and well-being, and that is a path worth taking. <laughs>
Thank you, Dr. McCarty. Um, thank you for sharing those students' words too. That was um, that was really awesome. And that was a wonderful transition uh, to Dr. Tiffany Lee. Um, so Dr. McCarty kind of mentioned this in um, thinking about policy, um, but I'm wondering what you have to say about the ways that um, uh, language is specifically important for Native youth and identity formation. Um, and as a pre-service teacher, I would love to hear your thoughts on what pre-service and in-service teachers should know about how we can make space for Native identity through language. Oh, yeah, thank you, Danya. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the relatives in, in the in the crowd. Yat A, Tiffany Lee Nishia, De Bethlehem Nishlin, Nathlan and Bashish Chin, Sandra Kinadasha Chado, Nathlan and Dashanella, Twan Salade Nasha, Diet Al A, Donado, Lakota, Asana Nishle. Thank you, everybody. Basically, I said, I'm Tiffany Lee. I am Black Sheep from Crystal, New Mexico, and Lakota from. Uh, um, Pine Ridge, South Dakota. I graduated from Susie in 1999, and I was a frequent and active member of SAIO and NACC. So I'm really happy to be here and see a lot of the familiar names and the participants. In fact, I just noticed on my desk, I have my 50th Stanford powwow um, mug here or, or water <laughs> bottle. Um, but I thank you for the questions. I uh, really like to speak to both uh, at the same time in terms of the importance of language to youth and what educators should know. Uh, my research has focused on Native youth and young adults' perspectives of language to their identity and their relationship to school as a cultural institution that might support or ignore or denigrate students' backgrounds. Um, from what I've learned and a lot of researchers have learned and what we've learned in our current study is how youth have um, very complex identities where they are strong in their sense of self, even if they are limited in their language skills, but they do desire more fluency in their language to have a stronger connection to their culture, families and heritage. Um, and so one thing that's important for educators to know, especially is how you frame uh, language and language change for indigenous youth and young adults. Um, Often in you know, the literature, we've seen terms like language decline, language extinction, language death. Uh, these are terms that are often used to describe linguistic change in Native communities, but they also frame language in a very deficit-oriented way and often label our, our own identities as inadequate because we are so tied to our language. Our language is such a strong part of who we are. It's, um, we do, there's not a separation. It's also tied to our worldviews and our epistemologies. Um, and while we can't deny language shift from our native languages to English, we can try to reframe how we understand this change to support community wellness, uh, in particular to support our youth's sense of identity and belonging. So regardless if youth speak English, a native language or any other language and at whatever level or skills that they bring as um, McCarty and colleagues have talked about that as their communicative repertoire, it's still a resource for learning. Uh, and bringing that into the classroom and seeing it as a strength and an asset is really important. Um, so in terms of connections to schools, um, what I've learned from um, youth and young adults is they often critique schools for their neglect of cultural relevance uh, in the classroom and content and curriculum. And, and for many, often the, also the hostile environment that they encounter. Um, yet, however, they, they often have no choice uh, to turn to the school for learning their heritage language. It's the one place that um, is, is offered for them if it's not in their home. Um, so what they end up doing, a lot of uh, students and youth in my study of studies, uh, has been that they locate safe spaces often with teachers or certain kinds of courses to engage in that kind of learning, to engage in learning about not just their language, but their cultural heritage. Uh, and through that, um, they develop a critical language awareness and uh, a real understanding of, of why language has changed in their communities over time and in their families. Um, and because of that, when they develop that critical language awareness, they become motivated then to want to contribute to language revitalization and they become agents of change in that respect. Um, so the um, majority of, of youth I've talked to um, in various studies uh, from those who are, who are fluent uh, to those who consider themselves non-speakers uh, have regarded language as, as essential to their cultural identity. 
Um, but that critical language awareness is what awakens them to those issues of language shift and to their abilities to create those spaces in school for culturally relevant education, often through their language courses. Um, those who have taken native language courses have often demanded from their teachers to have very effective, rigorous, and engaging curriculum and pedagogy. I, uh, one student uh, who I quote here, she, she says, I really want to learn Navajo uh, in, in terms of wanting, appreciating her teacher's very high expectations, not just to, to understand and speak it, but also to learn to read and write it. it this student felt that really helped her with her uh, language skills development. Um, and another example uh, at a feedback session at a school, uh, also on the Navajo Nation, um, when asked the principal, when we asked the principal why there was only one Navajo language teacher at the school, um, he made the proclamation that the students just weren't interested in taking it. They're just not interested. Um, but we were in a classroom full of students. So I asked the, the students, well, how many of you have taken the class or want to take it? Every single student ra raised their hand. So it was sort of a way to speak back to the principal's assumption about, about their value for their language. Um, in that same school, the, the teacher, um, she was often credited by, um, by the youth as creating that safe and uh, space for them and a strengthening space because she would develop these courses, not just to teach language, but to find a way to um, teach their connections to their clans, what their clans meant and the connection to family and through that learning their history of their family. So it, it did so much more than just, you know, the mechanics of language, but it really tied them to a sense of belonging to their communities and their, uh, and their homes. And I, I think I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCarty. Those words really um, struck me as a, as a non-speaker, um, but as somebody who really, really, really wants to learn my language. So thank you for sharing those. That was a moment of connection. Um, I'd like to um, talk to Stephanie, Dr. Stephanie Waterman um, next because uh, Dr. Lee spoke about um, indigenous students in high school, but Dr. Waterman's work um, has focused mostly on um, college. Um, so Dr. Waterman, can you talk a little bit about how modern colleges and universities are making space for native students, especially since um, a lot of indigenous students uh, travel and indigenous epistemologies, at least mine is incredibly place-based and the sort of how is home Home, something that like indigenous students have access to um, in universities. All right. Um, do I have Scanio? So I'm Stephanie Waterman. I'm on a Dago Turtle clan. I work in the, um, the traditional lands of the Huron Wendat, the Sasagas of the Credit, Anishinaabe, and the um, Senecas. I'm right now at Onondaga, my homeland, in our family home at Onondaga. I'm going to a conference, so I came home to visit for a little bit. So I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, so my research is all very similar to what uh, Dr. Lee just spoke about. Um, so how do modern colleges create safe spaces? Literally, by having a space on campus, a space to be indigenous. Native students express their appreciation for these spaces and their staff. This would be a Native American Student Affairs Office or Indigenous Student uh, Affairs Center. Not every institution that enrolls Indigenous students has such a center. It's very important for our students to have a place to go that's centrally located. Baysmore, James, and Dunright, even as primarily one-person offices, directors of ISAs provide a substantial amount of programming, including new, story, new student orientations, living learning communities, incoming student seminars, peer and faculty mentoring programs, community gatherings, heritage month programming programs, tutoring co-sponsored programs, student group advisement, and graduation ceremonies. These offices do it all. ISA professionals put students in their communities first, which can run into issues with administration. Povey, Trudget, Page, and Coates 2021 noted that indigenous faculty and staff will put a student's needs before their own free time. And we know how limited our free time is. So ISA units are crucial. They serve as bridges. Native fiscal calendars may not run on the same calendar as a higher ed institution. 
which can impact their financial aid or their, um, their support. Our bereavement practices are very often longer than the standard three day at an institution. And the colonial settler colonial holiday schedule rarely matches up with any of our ceremonial um, calendars. Students name these centers, indigenous faculty and staff is crucial to their higher ed experiences, yet they are often underfunded, always seem to be under some threat of a cut, are sometimes placed within multicultural affairs offices, often placed on the edge of campus or in a basement if you can find it, and they are typically deeply understaffed. Consequently, there's burnout. They do a huge service for the institution. Retention keeps tuition dollars rolling in. They also serve that community service bridge for land grant institutions. They support academics, they support other staff on campus. I really think these staff and faculty should be more recognized for what they do and receive that support. As a cultural hub, their programming features indigenous scholars and community leaders, academic opportunities like through ACES, American Indian Science and Engineering Society, and language clubs, or a place to practice one's language, drumming, or for artistic development. While an ISA's programming overall cultural foundation will be central to its location, so at Syracuse University, it's Haudenosaunee based, indigenous students find enough cultural commonality to feel connected to the local cultural programming. A student who did not want me to share her tribe but let's say from the West Coast, which is, which is huge, um, told me, Haudenosaunee program strengthened her own cultural understanding. Quote, it was seeing the same thing in a different way. She said when she went back home, she said her ceremonies felt more meaningful. And I know indigenous faculty and staff who have had students over for the weekend and used to take students with them to ceremony. I know at least one ISA unit that has used emergency funds to pay for a flight for a student who needed to go home. ISA staff, particularly if they are indigenous, understand that need. That's the key, that understanding, not having to explain. Indigenous faculty offer history and law classes, literature classes, and courses in the sciences. They serve as role models and validation of our indigenous knowledge systems. They're role models of being indigenous and being an academic. Like at the University of Toronto, we have indigenous centered courses in geography, religions, law, and indigenous research methodologies. But U of T is a big institution with a large number of indigenous faculty and staff. Smaller institutions struggle with course offerings and recruiting and retaining indigenous faculty and staff. And very often an academic appointment is made to head the student the Indigenous Student Services Office, which I think is, um, can be problematic. With a strong contingent of Native faculty and staff, there are resources to support Indigenous language revitalization and to form respectful relationships with local communities. I can't emphasize enough the importance of these units. You want help? Thank you, Dr. Waterman. Um, I definitely related to that as well. Um, when I was in college, that was something that I was craving and wasn't really as accessible to me. So thank you for that. Um, so we're gonna transition just a bit because we would be remiss. Dr. Waterman actually lifted something that um, was, is, and was um, a huge issue in my college experience, um, which was bereavement practices. Um, so during the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously a lot of people experienced a lot of loss and the ways that indigenous folks often uh, go through the process of mourning um, takes longer than um, many Western institutions make space for. So um, I'm wondering if anybody on the panel wants to sort of talk about some of the most in light of COVID, it can be related to COVID, but it doesn't have to be. Just what are some of the most pressing things that you see indigenous students facing in their educational worlds right now? And how do you see them countering the loss and the risk that we've all been experiencing for the past few years? Um, and I will just leave it open and whoever wants to go first is welcome to. Well, I'll just share that in New Mexico, um, 
that's one of the most current and pressing issues has been a constant one that brought up a lawsuit. Uh, and as some of you might be familiar with the Yazzie and Martinez consolidated lawsuit versus the state of New Mexico, which um, both Yazzie and Martinez uh, plaintiffs won um, back in 2018, I believe. Um, but basically the state uh, was is being held accountable for not providing an adequate education according to the New Mexico state constitution for Native American students, English language learners, students with special abilities, and um, um, low-income students, which Native American students make up all four realms of those of those areas, right? So I think you know it's it has a lot to do with the fact that um, the schools, public school system, at least, while it's made different efforts in various capacities overall. There's a systemic problem of of children, native children, not being able to see themselves in the in their curriculum and not their perspectives and experiences not being um, understood or or even taught across you know the state. And so I think through the uh, the research project that we're working on with Indigenous language immersion schools, we're really seeing models there that can transform education to really embrace native communities and their knowledge and their language and and they control it they control what and they define what is education for their children um, and i think that's really the the movement forward it has been for a long time but i think the indigenous language immersion schools really give us probably the best model for showing us how to um, define and control our own education according to our own values and and um needs and interests. Um, Tiffany, maybe I could just add, um, just because one of the questions related to COVID um, and uh, this relentless pandemic that we're, that we're in, um, that we have been, you know, witness to some of the the really uh, devastating impacts um, that COVID has had. As as one uh, principal of one immersion school said, it's difficult for our language and culture to thrive in a setting that keeps us away from each other. And I think we can think about that from pre-K to you know um, to co college and beyond. But she also said um, there's also this equally relentless um, resilience and um, and I think that that comes from some of the the practices and the values that that we've seen in these schools but that we know um, extend beyond these schools that is you know collaboration mutuality relationality um, and this principle said collaborating and helping each other has made this whole process much easier so um, I mean, I think many of the, I'll just uh, stop and say, I think many of the challenges that we're seeing today are some of the same challenges in the past, um, edu you know, education assessments that uh, push schools and programs away from the very practices that we know um, are, are, are beneficial to students, to families, to communities, to that holistic well-being that we talked about. But I think too that there's, um, as Tiffany just said, there's just incredible um, motivation, um, collective and individual um, to work beyond and around uh, those constraints. And one positive thing too is some of the state policies that we're seeing um, that are requiring not only the, the integration of indigenous histories and content, but also um, face front um, dealing with important things like tribal sovereignty in our schools. So, and I, I think maybe your your home where your home land, Donia, is one place where some of those policies are being implemented. I'd like to follow up with the positivity there. Um, so I think one thing with COVID when it hit, um, Onondaga is a very small community. And um, we immediately went to ceremony like we were instructed. We have instructions to deal with something like this. And the turnout was huge. 
And I think because we haven't really been able to go back to ceremony face to face in a crowded longhouse together, um, ceremonies have become in a way more important so that some family members, when we do have ceremony now, fully masked, um, people in families take turns to represent the family in ceremony and bring back what they learned. So it's kind of like individual families are now being more responsible to learn and teach their own families. Um, so that that sense of the importance of the ceremony, I think, um, has increased during this and how it's helping us get through. I think we've been very lucky here, knock on wood. And the other thing that I think is really positive is our many of um, our traditional teachings that you would not get in a longhouse, the ones that are more public, like our creation stories, have been offered online. So no matter where you are, you have this whole crowd listening to uh, one of our elders like Tommy Porter and they're being offered regularly. I've heard more speakers in the last two years that I've always wanted to get to, but didn't want to drive through the snow um, and take two and a half hours somewhere in one direction. Um, and just how our elders have embraced this technology to share their knowledge and the language groups that have popped up. That's another thing, you don't have to drive to somebody's house and, or to a class to, to practice language. And there are, there are many to choose from now, whereas before, where is it being held? How long does it take me to get there? So I see that as real positive that I think will keep going. Um, just in a different, we can keep going in a different way. And I think that was something that we learned through all of this. I think institutions learned some of that too, even though they keep wanting to go face to face all the time. I think I could um, add a little bit on the positive note. Um, we've had in the last, probably just pre-COVID, some major, um, um, issues at the university level in terms of our indigenous students, uh, voices being heard, um, macroaggressions uh, from the university level toward our students. Um, but I have to say that uh, the spaces that we have at the um, University of Arizona in particular, um, it happened to be um, a special uh, pilot course that we had, which were, we brought together um, a group of indigenous thinkers, right? So it's a writing class. We have um, an in, uh, international indigenous course um, on Tuesday nights every fall. Um, that's another space and um, oral traditions class and, um, and a language and culture and education class that has tended to bring um, indigenous students like in cohorts. And so they kind of uh, keep moving along together on those courses in the spaces that I'm in, which has been really fortunate. And uh, in that way, they've been able to support each other and in and out of class. And they have done some amazing things. Um, we've got a couple of um, students who created a um, Educators Unite network system across the state with the Arizona Teacher of the Year um, and did that immediately um, in COVID, that the, when the first COVID um, impact hit and some students and everyone was doing uh, online. But they, they have really um, been resilient. Um, and thank goodness that those spaces like courses in the institution has been very positive and uh, nurturing and uh, space for them to come together. So they've been a good support network for each other. Um, and I'm glad to say that that um, has been helpful in many ways. 
Thank you um, to all, all the panelists for that. That was um, very wonderful. And I appreciate you continuing to lift up the positivity and the resilience and the um, uh, the, the relentless um, insistence against like just being erased and stuff like that. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to shift to audience questions in four minutes, um, but I kind of wanted to um, just do a very quick rip or whip around with everyone, um, Dr. Lee and Dr. McCarty. Um, uh, sort of lifted this a moment ago, and I would like to sort of elevate it a little bit more, just sort of thinking before we shift to audience on um, a particular student you had or group of students who um, really challenged your thinking or centered like a joy in their identity as an Indigenous person. Um, I know that there are probably a lot coming up for you, but just if we could do a quick whip around of just naming that student or, you know, just talking about that experience, I would personally really love that. Um, and if we could just go in the order that we went in a moment ago. So Dr. Lee goes first. So um, I think, you know, there's, a, I have a lot of examples, just seeing all, all hundreds of indigenous children speaking their heritage language is like so moving and rewarding and, and transformative, but uh, I'll go to my current role as a Native American studies professor. Um, I think the students in our, program um, who've really advocated on behalf of, in fact, they're, they're the ones who really uh, started Native American Studies at UNM back in 1970, which is when we uh, first had first started our program, but they also have continued to advocate to have Native American Studies develop a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and eventually a PhD now, uh, where we'll be the fourth in the country with a PhD. So I think, you know, I, I can't name us, you know, there's several students and I don't want to leave anybody out, but <laughs> I think they um, they have been the the transform transformative change agents that always influence and inspire me. Yeah, it just so happens that literally right on the heels of this, um, this event, I just came off of a dissertation proposal defense, a very successful one of one of our um, PhD students who is going to be um, doing a case study of a Native American a group, Native American youth group um, that are the storytellers, Lu Luisano um, uh, youth storytellers on the Rincon Reservation. And um, I think, so I, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to name specific students too, because there are, uh, there are so many, um, wonderful students, but what I what I wanted to say is it's really, really heartening to see um, younger people, younger scholars coming into this, um, this field of language reclamation and to see this intergenerational quality of the movement. And now they are going to be the, the leaders of, um, of the next generation of scholars, of teachers, of educators, and, and young uh, leaders in their own communities and indigenous nations. So that is very heartening to me. I, I think my, um, my stories are uh, two students who recently earned their PhDs in the just last spring and fall. And they're both um, currently employed, uh, one is a, a faculty already, um, in a very um, traditional kind of uh, program where they are working with, um, and, and the two of us have talked a lot, which has been really uh, exciting uh, in terms of the discourse and change in a, a program that typically deals with visually impaired or disabilities programs, and uh, how much we have um, shifted some of the discourse and saying that um, in, in indigenous communities, uh, you know, uh, different ways of reading and experiencing the world in the different modalities is really a gift. And it's a gift that we should all learn from. And so um, as a, a single person in that department at the moment as an indigenous uh, faculty, um, he's been staying in touch with me in terms of that support. So that's really a nice um, uh, occurrence in that I, I'm maintaining that connection. And I also have a, another connection with a previous student who is um, doing really great things. And it's really exciting to see 
um, former students um, actually just doing wonderful work out there. Um, and then I have one another student who was able to really insert uh, a very indigenous framing of her dissertation um, that really was welcomed and it really changed a lot of the conversation around her work as well. So in those ways, um, it's really exciting to see these students um, working and there's more coming up um, and that's even more exciting too. It just excites me. It gives me hope for the future when I see student activism um, working towards uh, education for climate change and how language art language informs climate restoration. I guess um, because we have words in our language that are more meaningful. You know, it's not just a tree, right? Um, so whenever I see any of that on campus, that really excites me and um, to be young again, right? <laughs> um, but recently I've read, I've been on some committees of some dissertations by students that were not traditionally written. So one was a story and the creativity and the intellect to be able to incorporate your literature review into a story was phenomenal. And then another one where parts of the conversations were fictionalized, where, where actually Coyote was questioning her. And um, that dialogue, she also performed her oral as a conversation. Um, and then again, incorporating the literature review and her findings into this stylized and part of it was um, fictionalized story. It was 16 chapters, but it had to be the way she wrote it. Wow, that's coming to this academic field and an academic field in a very creative indigenous way. This is how we tell a story. And that's what she did. And it was beautiful. And it's this kind of thing where you can read uh, over 200 pages, you don't want to put it down. I mean, how many dissertations have you read like that? Um, so that's something that's like kind of knocked me on my feet. Like, wow, that is so cool. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was a, that was really beautiful. And I would, I would love to one day write a dissertation or a capstone in that style. That sounds wonderful. And that actually segues really well into I see so many audience questions. Thank you to the audience for all of your wonderful questions. I wish we had time to answer all of them. Um, cause I could sit and chat with this panel for I think hours and hours and hours. Um, but that segues, um, really well into Jarita Gray eyes, um, a student here at Stanford's question, um, about how, um, many of you were, um, the, one of the few or were the only indigenous person interested in indigenous research um, in your training. And so Jarita is asking, um, what is the most hopeful or exciting development in doctoral programs that you've seen since you completed your own academic training? Well, I'll say, you know, I did my doctoral training at Stanford. <laughs> And it was through a postdoc, through AERA actually, that allowed me to come back to UNM and work with really well-known and um, up-and-coming Indigenous scholars. So I think the exciting thing is that there is just now a wealth of resources in terms of academic literature and people who've written about this and um, that we can learn from, but there's also lots of networks of, of um, indigenous people and doctoral students um, who have found those safe spaces again to to really um, foster you know what it means to do indigenous based research and what does that mean for each of our communities how do we define that and problematizing it and you know and, and then implementing it so yeah. I was going to say something similar about how there's so many more resources now. There's so much more literature. There's so many more of us. You know, when I was doing my doc program, I was the only person, indigenous person in my program 
And I found uh, Dr. Brian Braboy's dissertation like in March and I defended it in April. So I incorporated that in and I was basically teaching my faculty about indigenous higher education. Um, but you know, that's changed so much now. We have a really good cohort and faculty and it's really cool, so yeah. I had the um, opportunity to be uh, in an American Indian study, um, studies department. That's where I have my degree, two degrees from. But Dr. McCarty was my my chair for both my master's and um, my PhD. So I had um, the best of both worlds in, in, in many ways. Um, but in the American Indian studies uh, program, um, I think at the early time, because I was there early in, in the development, uh, there were uh, faculty there, and there was a community there, and a cohort of um, Indigenous students who were very small yet at the time. But I think one of the best things that happened for me there was that the flexibility, um, because at that time I didn't see uh, uh, really an ind uh, Indigenous language kind of um, coursework or program, but I was able to, to work with Dr. McCarty and create that trajectory for myself and with her help. So in many ways, um, that program had uh, the flexibility and provided the opportunity for me to actually do what I wanted to in terms of uh, research. And um, that was the resources that I had. Um, but in terms of you know, um, faculty in the department, it, it was uh, quite a while before we brought in additional indigenous faculty. I was the only one in the College of Edge for a number of years before we brought in um, 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 a couple who came together as a, as a spousal hire. So now we have, um, we're growing. Um, one of my own students, uh, previous students is in the faculty position. And we probably have about, uh, I would say about six now in the college. Um, so it's, it's getting better. <laughs> Dr. McCarty, I wasn't um, sure if you wanted to take a stab at this question. Um, I know that you don't identify as indigenous, but if there was something you wanted to. No, I think my colleagues have have said it, um, you know, and, and obviously uh, put the time span in there. Um, I was a baby assistant professor when she was starting her graduate program. So um, it's taken, you know, a long time, but it's, it's really wonderful to see um, these things that my colleagues are talking about. Maybe the best thing is that we're still working together. Um, I mean, um, you know, we're, st we're still working at it too. Yeah, we're still working at it. <laughs> There's a lot of good work yet to do. Okay, I was, thank you so much for the, our great moderator, Donia, and our great panelists and for the very invigorating discussion. Thank you so much for sharing the insights, lessons, and also hopes for future, for better future and more inclusive education research. We are at the time. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. And I look forward for such con uh, discussions continue onward. Thanks again and have a great rest of the day. <laughs>